Um, my name is Ed, I'm uh, Jim Walsh, I'm a Vice President here in the University of Forest Strategy and Quality. Um, I want to welcome Minister uh, Buddy Coffey, you uh, the conference participants. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you here today to Minute University, located here in Ireland's only university town on a campus that blends the traditional formal layout that you will have seen of the 19th century buildings with a modern and rapidly expanding campus just across the old Hillcock Road, if you've time to go for a walk at lunchtime, they can take it past our new library that opened just last year. Um, the theme of today's conference, Creating the Regions of Tomorrow, Maximising Ireland's Reform Opportunity, uh, is uh, extremely important and very timely. Uh, it requires us to think about the future of this country from a regional perspective, as we emerge from the deepest crisis that beset uh, this state. It is certainly a challenging time, but also one of great opportunity, which will become evident throughout the, uh, today. We are very fortunate in the uh, programme that's been compiled by Gavin and Mark on behalf of Espon and Nursa uh, in terms of the range of speakers and perspectives that will be brought to address the issues that now uh, confront us uh, from a regional perspective, but also that we have, I think, set out the many opportunities that are there. And we'll uh, be coming back to that time and time again shortly. It is a particular pleasure to welcome Mr. Polly Coffey, Minister of State at the Department of the Environment, with special responsibility for housing, planning, and coordination, and coordination of the Construction 2020 strategy. All of these responsibilities are highly pertinent to, the, to today's conference. Minister Coffey has been a full-time national politician since 2007, when he was elected to Shannon Dairn. In 2011, he was elected as a member of Thaw Dairn and was appointed as a member of the Giant Eroctus Committee on Environment, Heritage and the Culture. Prior to his involvement in national politics, Mr. Coffey was an elected member of the Waterford County Council since 1999, in which capacity he served as Deputy Mayor of Waterford County uh, and also as Chairman of the South East Region Authority. He therefore brings a wide range of experience to his current role as Minister of State at the Department of Environment. We are delighted and honoured that you have been able to come here this morning and take some time to attend and open this conference for us. On behalf of the University, the conference organisers and you the participants, I want to thank you for making time to be here and to share a few views with us. You're now welcome to take that. Thank you very much, Jim. Indeed, I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, to, to address you at the opening of what I believe is a very important uh, conference. And indeed, it's at a very uh, beautiful venue. I just had a quick walk around the, some of the campus there. And what better a place to have a conference on such a beautiful day. So I want to sincerely wish you all the very best in your endeavours here today. Um, Jim mentioned, you know, a little bit about my background. I actually come from a place in County Waterford called Port Law, which is a, a planned industrial town, planned by a, a Quaker family called the Malcolmsons back in the 1800s, that provided for almost 5,000 people that serviced and worked in a cotton mill. And I often say as I walk around my own town, how well those people planned this village in terms of employment, in terms of housing, which was of a much higher standard for that time, in terms of the infrastructure they provided, uh, you know, mains gas, mains water, education, uh, culture. They had it all back in the 1800s because those people knew what planning was all about. And I'm very proud that I come from a, a town like that. So we all bring our unique um, experience growing up in our livelihoods and all of that to our various roles, and that's one that I certainly bring. As a new Minister of State at the Department of the Environment, Community and Local Government, together with Minister Alan Kelly, uh, I want to outline to you today the steps that both we as Ministers and this Government are taking to ensure that strong regions are at the heart of the national recovery and the reform agenda. Indeed, while I have a national remit in my role as Minister, uh, as someone from Waterford, I have always held very passionate views about balanced regional development and the need for strong regions, uh, being an essential prerequisite for a strong nation and a strong economy. Without going over our recent history, it has to be accepted that the economic crisis and the necessary adjustments this government has had to make in fiscal policy and budgets to get us back on the right path 
have perhaps been felt disproportionately around our land. Phrases like the two-tier economy, the two-speed economy, or urban opportunity versus rural deprivation are reminders to us all that it is foolish in the extreme to ignore the regional development dimension to overall national efforts around recovery and reform. Some say that the crash-driven uh, crash increases in unemployment and out-migration have re-exposed all disparities temporarily, masked by the construction bubble with the geography of our emergent economic recovery, having the sense of a two-speed Ireland with new employment and investment ever more concentrated in the larger cities competing at a global scale. And again, somebody from the region, when we look, I often see Dublin almost like a vortex, pulling in all of the investments, pulling in everything that's happening, and rightly so is our capital. But as we can all see now, the pressures that it brings on housing, on infrastructure, and all of those related areas. So it has to be accepted that in the midst of the crisis, we have now emerged from the understandable priority had to be on steadying this keel of the national ship. And now as calmer waters are visible from the helm, attention must turn to making the necessary repairs to the structures that will shape and drive our regions, in tackling the challenges of the future and locking in a virtuous cycle of planning, sustainability and prosperity to replace the old cycles of boom and bust. The government has wrestled the public finances back from the brink and we have now stabilised the economy. But we are not deluding ourselves either and we know that the job is not complete. We are still borrowing 800 million euros per month to run our country. Moving from break even to paying our way means finding ways to enhance the economic activity of our country in a way that harnesses our amazing potential as a small but dynamic, agile and strategically located nation, island nation at the heart of the European project and an economy amongst the most open in terms of our dependence on global trade. So, from a regional development perspective, what is happening in moving the focus from national stabilisation to regional mobilisation? At the big picture level, government has agreed an EU co cohesion funding package for 2014 to 2020, which is worth 1.2 billion euros to Ireland. There are huge oppor opportunities here in relation to both urban and rural development measures that my department will be working to advance in relation to areas such as rural development and the proposed regional operational programmes to be managed by the regional assemblies. These regional programmes will include a dedicated urban development dimension designed to progress key regeneration, sustainable development and transport projects to breed new life into key cities. The mention of the assemblies brings me to our efforts in implementing the government's ambitious proposals for local government and planning reform. These reforms represent a key opportunity for Ireland to implement meaningful policies and to frame new governance institutions to counteract unbalanced uh, development and promote regional recovery. As promised under the Government's Action Programme for Local Government Reform, Putting People First, one of the key objectives of the reform programme is bringing the economic and spatial planning processes and at national and local levels closer to better coordinate the provision of physical, social, cultural and innovation infrastructure to make places with national and international competitive advantage. Creating conditions for sustainable, regional and therefore national economic success must be built upon the foundation of the inputs of all key actors, private sector, public sector, infrastructure providers, innovation and skill providers, all working together to fully activate the key potentials and strengths of the regions, so that they too can contribute optimally to the performance of the state as a whole. My department, in conjunction with the chief executives of the local authorities, the two existing assemblies and the relevant government departments are now intensively engaged in progressing the supporting establishment order, workforce planning and resource identification exercises necessary to enable the formation of three new regional assemblies promised under PPF on the 1st of January 2015. The key function of the new regional assemblies will be to prepare the way for the integration of regional planning and economic development. Through the, new, through the new regional spatial and economic strategies to be developed from 2016 onwards, and that will sit against the strategic context of overall government strategies for economic development and spatial planning, including the Action Programme for Jobs and the new National Planning Framework. The new regional strategies will be tasked with providing the answers to some key questions, including what level of economic performance and output 
can the new assembly areas and their constituent sub-regional uh, components realistically aim for? How many jobs will be likely to be created and in what sectors? And what roles will urban places and indeed rural areas uh, play in supporting the economic strategies? What strategic interventions are required to realise the long-term economic strategy for the regions in terms of investment in infrastructure, protection of the environment and community development? And how will the interventions be delivered, by which body and by when? Our regional structures are being rebooted, so to speak, strengthening the link between local government and central government, and setting the scene for the coordination of the new and developing local economic and community plans at local authority level. The government intends that the new regional strategies will perform a key coordination function for not only the activities of relevant government departments and agencies, but the local authorities and key regional development, business, innovation and learning interests. In this regard, we have almost moved to tackle historical weaknesses in obtaining the necessary commitment from public bodies to regional and local plans. The regional, spatial and economic strategies will be backed with the legal and administrative underpinnings necessary to ensure that they will be effective and followed through by all relevant public sector bodies, particularly the local authorities and those with responsibility for economic development and enterprise promotion. All relevant agencies will be accountable to the regional assemblies as regards the progress being made towards the achievement of the objectives of the new regional strategies. A key purpose is to ensure a coherent and collaborative approach to economic development across each region rather than, for example, different areas competing for the same investment project. This is to ensure delivery of improved coordination of regional economic development policies and investment across the state and private sectors in general. The new National Oversight and Audit Commission will have a role to play in overseeing the coordination process, reporting to the Minister in relation to the buy-in of all relevant actors to the regional strategies. Next, I will turn to the scene setter for the renaissance of regional development in Ireland, the National Planning Framework. They say that to fail to plan is to plan to fail. Regional development objectives and regional assemblies are worthless without an effective national planning and development context to energise, support and drive the approach at regional level. We have had spatial strategies in the past. The National Spatial Strategy had its big launch and it has to be said that it was the first of its kind not only in Ireland, but it was pioneering too in how it marked a resurgence in EU member state policy interests in areas like territorial development and cohesion and balanced regional development. The National Spatial Strategy borrowed many innovative concepts from the European Spatial Development perspective. However, while previous governments initially liked their new creation, commitments waned in the face of taking the really hard decisions around the prioritisation of investment. We need a decisiveness and real commitment to investment in the regions and working across the sectors. And what did we get? We got decentralisation and we all realised how that undermined that particular national spatial strategy. Inconsistent policies that failed to support the strategy from a whole of government perspective undermined all of this process. And as a result, our national spatial strategy has become more synonymous with shaping the planning system at local level rather than properly bringing a whole of government approach to energising and empowering the innate economic potential of our regions. This is why, together with Minister Kelly, I hope to finalise proposals in the coming weeks for the preparation of a new national planning framework. As Minister, I want the national planning framework to be new, to be different, but more importantly, to deliver. In my view, the national planning framework needs to be, to be both more strategic and more action-orientated setting the scene for the regional, spatial and economic strategies that I have just described, devolving indeed the detail of working out how regions can deliver on the promise of this government on the national, under the national planning framework. My department received a very interesting and challenging scoping report from a small group of national and international exports and has submitted detailed proposals to government on the best way to proceed. But we are up against the clock and time is not our friend. With the new assemblies being in place from the 1st of January 2015 and a statutory requirement for the new regional strategies kicking in from 2016, the government needs the new strategy to be in place in 2016. And of course there will be a full consultation process as well as the need to observe EU requirements around strategic environmental assessment and assessment under the Habitats Directive. To succeed the National Planning Framework 
must be built upon a whole of government view on our national development priorities and potential and for a sustainable prosperity. The national planning framework must demonstrate a spatial vision for our nation that encompasses both urban and rural, cities and towns, our land, our seas, and we must address the relevant issues from the high street to the farm gate and everything in between. The national planning framework will be given a statutory footing and will be subject to public and political scrutiny. The next legislative milestone will be two planning bills which we will, we will publish later this year and into 2015, providing for the implementation of specific planning reform commitments under the construction strategy and the construction 2020 strategy of which I have direct responsibility for, and also the establishment of an office for planning regulation. The final report of the Manhattan Planning Tribunal opened a window to a time when the greed and profits motives of developers and land speculators rather than the sustainable wishes of the community were seen to be the drivers of our planning process. We also need to remind ourselves that much of the reason that we're faced with such severe fiscal and economic challenges at present is because of past obsessions with property and our dependence on property development rather than the type of economic and spatial planning that secures lasting and sustainable economic and social development. The establishment of an independent planning regulator is one of the most fundamental recommendations in the Tribunal report, and I am determined to see this recommendation as fully and comprehensively considered and appropriately acted upon. The primary function of the Office of the Planning Regulator, which will be established with an independent corporate identity, will be to carry out independent appraisal of regional and local level statutory plans prepared and adopted under the Planning and Development Act 2000, as amended, namely local authority development plans and local area plans, and the future regional, spatial and economic strategies of the regional assemblies. The Office of Planning Regulation will also have investigative powers to examine uh, inter alia possible systemic failings in the planning system, again taking account of the recommendations of the Manhattan Tribunal uh, in this regard. To guide the work of the regulator of, uh, of Angor Planola, local authorities, regional assemblies and all relevant interests, I am also in the process of finalising the preparation of a policy statement on planning. The policy statement will be a short, focused, easily read document stating what it is exactly that we want the planning process to do, the core values of that important process and the key principles that will underpin policy development in this area. This government was elected to move our country from the old thinking of previous administrations that created boom-bust cycles towards progressive economic, social and environmental policies to secure lasting and sustainable prosperity. The government's commitment around local government reform, including its regional dimension, a new national planning framework, the establishment of an independent office for planning regulation and a planning policy statement are a visible demonstration that unlike what Fintan O'Toole writes about in the Irish Times about not learning from past mistakes, the government is indeed learning from past mistakes and is deadly serious about learning from our recent past more especially. From a regional development perspective, I very much believe that you will agree with me that the reforms and initiatives underway promise a true renaissance of regional thinking and real regional development. And I look forward to working with you all in all of the various sectors and value your contribution in delivering on that promise. Um, I conclude now by saying I want to wish you all the very best in your endeavours today and indeed in the future as we plan uh, the best way as we now move from the st stability phase of our economy to the growth and development phase. And that is where I think, you know, heads with your experience, uh, your vision can certainly uh, lead uh, and help us in, in, in that way. I do apologise that I cannot stay longer, I actually have to leave. I have appointments in the region that I love and that I'm passionate about, in the South East region that has its own challenges. And I'm going back there today to try and assist that region in meeting some of the, um, the, the vision that I've already outlined here today. So I want to wish you all the very best and to you Jim and thank Menus for organising such a valuable conference because I think it is important we have this debate and this discourse. Uh, to map our way forward to sustainable development again in this country. So I uh, thank you very much.